Um, this is uh, Stack 200, and I'm Ellen Fireman. And a uh, short introduction, I've been teaching here at the U of I large lectures since 1992. And um, first in the math department, I taught calculus, linear algebra, pre-calculus, lots of different courses, and then I moved over to stats. And um, I'm also the creator of STAT 100 and 200. Um, I guess I did that in about 100 and about 2000. And um, then I did uh, just this version of 200, there are prior versions. So I'm very, very interested in course development and um, innovative ways to teach. And so right now, you're involved in a, um, the content of this course is uh, characterized by trying to teach through iconic examples. Uh, I think that people, uh, if you, you know, use words or math or whatever other, you know, we're trying to, to in this class, we're going to try to integrate technical jargon with mathematics and with, um, of course, with logic, but also with everyday language. But I think the thing that ties it all together and helps people remember are iconic examples. So you're very lucky, or I'm very lucky, we all are, to be have an iconic example that we're going to be using throughout the semester that we're actually involved in. And it's a study comparing the online to the in-person versions. And so this is being recorded right now so that the online people can see it and you can see it too. It's called, this is, uh, I'm doing this with step 100 and 200 uh, in connection with 100, it's in connection with Carmen Flanagan. And so what we're doing is we're doing, or the system is, the acronym is COOL, Coordinated Online Learning. So you can go over here and it's school, cool, step one, stack 200. So the idea is that um, we want to integrate the online and in-person classes so that everybody has all the resources available in both. So you guys, if you want to, if you fall asleep during lecture, or you know, the people are here, or you miss something and you want to see this again, a few hours this after, later this afternoon, it will be available right here on our website. And the way, just Google STAT 200 and you'll find our website. Um, I sent everybody uh, an email, I hope you all got it, uh, and uh, describing uh, the different websites that we'll be, use, we'll be using. So that's the short intro that I'm uh, very interested in uh, course development. And there's an ongoing experiment that we'll be analyzing. So uh, now what are we going to do today? Today what I'm going to do is first go over the uh, syllabus and all the course policies and the materials that are available to everybody. And then we're going to start our first lecture on uh, experimental design. Uh, so first let's start with the syllabus. So, so here's the whole page right here. And uh, as you can see, there's lots of small sections here, and then a there's a big online section. Now, uh, so I think y'all know why everyone needs to know statistics today. I don't have to explain that. When I used to teach linear algebra to business majors for seven years, I did that at the U of I, Math 125. Um, I always had to explain why it was important. Why do we have to know it in null spaces? Why do we have to know? And I really didn't have a good answer for business majors. But the statistics, I never get asked that question, so I think you all know it's super important. Certainly in terms of getting a job but, and making sense out of large amounts of data, but also just in your everyday life. I hope that um, you'll, I hope that this course will help you make, see, see data differently and also be able to make decisions, political, financial, basically all decisions that involve uncertainty, which is almost everything, in a more informed way. So, uh, so there's three main goals to the course, and one I talked about using a conceptual, intuitive approach. 
So one thing that's unique about this course is that you don't get a huge set of formulas. In fact, you don't even get a formula sheet for exams because I try as much as possible to integrate formulas into a few simple ones that also contain within them uh, the process so it's apparent, very transparent, what the formula is doing. So I simplify the formulas into a few uh, ones so you don't have to remember a whole bunch of them. And yet we cover almost all the basic statistical cool tools that you'll need if, if you went to 420 or a uh, future course. Um, so there's an enormous array of uh, a huge toolbox you'll get uh, uh, after, at the end of this course. You'll have a lot of different ways to solve problems. And um, the other thing that's unusual about this course is that I'm very interested in causal inference. And so uh, determining you know, whether something is a predictor is easy to do, but whether it also is a cause is much more difficult. And so, uh, and we all want to know that, right? Because if something causes something else, that means we can change it, right? We can change the outcome. So that's something I'm extremely interested in, and I think everybody is. I mean, we all, our minds, we're sort of hardwired in a way to uh, attribute causes erroneously. So it's extremely, that's just the way our mind works. So it's very important to use statistics to keep us, uh, to be able to, be able to do it in a more uh, intelligent way. What cause, what, what is a cause and what is it? So that's something we're going to be doing a lot of. And then, of course, statistical software is key because there's large amounts of data. So uh, we have this great uh, data program that we're going to be using a lot that's just uh, right here. It's a simple point and click uh, program that even a fifth grader could use, I think. And so we can use that to really dive in and analyze data and get really excited about it and figure out things that would ordinarily uh, you'd have to be at a much higher level to understand. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to be doing this a lot with our own data. Uh, so act as our own scientists with our own data. And then uh, we're also going to be learning uh, the uh, statistical computing language R. So we're, you're going to have weekly assignments on that. So that's the idea, the philosophy behind the course, and then let's just take a look at the syllabus. And please interrupt me with questions. If you have any questions whatsoever, please interrupt me. All right, so three websites here. The course web, web page, which we're looking at. Where you submit homework called Long Kappa. Um, not only homework, but anything that you so, submit. Bonus work, everything even sign-up sheets for uh, conflict exams. And then we have the Compass site, which is where we display grades and I send announcements from. Uh, Long Kappa doesn't have a good grade book, so it's a little confusing that you have the three websites. I wish there was one. This one I, I wouldn't give up because this is not password protected, so you can, you'll have, you know, this will be available always. You can always get to this 10 years after you finish this course. If you want to go back and look at this, you can see this. So this is always here. Okay, so now we have this textbook. That's the incomplete lecture notes. These uh, I see most of you have it here. That's where we're going to start uh, later in the hour. And um, and then the calculator that you need. You can use any calculator on your homework, obviously. But for exams, we don't want you to use a programmable calculator. So. Uh, this one, we recommend this one, but anything, any non-programmable calculator is fine. Um, if you're unsure about it, just uh, send me a screenshot of your, of your calculator and I'll let you know. So, as I said before, um, you're welcome to, if you're online watching this would, and you want to participate in the discussion here or want to be in person, you're welcome to do that or go to any sections. And similarly, uh, you guys, you signed up for the in-person class, and I really hope you stay, because I don't want to be lecturing to no one. But um, I'm not taking attendance, but it's just I won't have any energy lecturing to no, so I'm very happy you signed up. And I hope to learn all your names and that we can, um, you know, know each other. And so I really hope there's other motivation for you coming here, not just to get points, but because we'll interact. 
So, um, and I think that's, if you really, you know, but of course if you're sick, if you miss a class, or if you just don't feel like coming one day, you know you haven't missed anything because you can always watch it online. Or if you fall asleep in class, which is bound to happen, even if you look awake, you know, we all do that. Then you can say, hey, I missed this part, especially when you're doing the homework. You're going to say, what did she say? You know, I have it written down in my notes, but I just want to see that portion. Okay, so I want you to utilize everything that's available to you. All right, now, let's see what else. Office hours, we have long office hours, three hours every afternoon. So uh, stop by, and this is the longest office hours that I've had for a while. Um, you probably won't need, most people might not need to come, but always, never, if you have any glitch, particularly when you start doing the R homework, those, you know, it, whenever you use any computer program, as you probably know, computers in general, you're going to run into glitches. So this is just so you won't have frustrations. You know where to go, and it will always have somebody there who can help you. Okay. Um, then we have the homework, um, and... We'll go into that in a minute, uh, and I'll show you what it looks like on Long Kappa. It's due every Tuesdays and Thursdays, and also we have the art homework due on Sundays. And here's we have an exam schedule, evening exams, and um, when we get to the calendar, I'll show you what where uh, when they are, and grading. So uh, here's the breakdown, 25% for homework, 25% for each of the exams. The final is really just a third midterm, it's not cumulative. And then there's bonus points that are awarded for, there's these pre-lecture uh, bonus problems. And if you took stat 100, raise your hand if you did already. Okay, these are the same ones, sorry. <laughs> Most all of them are the same ones that you saw in stat 100. We only, so far, unless I make some new ones, they only go to the first for their you know first portion of the class. So I'm going to try to make. I have some new ones. I'll try to make more, but these will be the same ones as saw before. <coughs> and then uh, a completed notebook. So while you're here, we're going to be working. The notebook's going to be a workbook, and hopefully with a small class like this, we could you could even work. You know, I can give you time to just fill in examples or work together. We'll see. We'll try some new things. This is the first time I've taught a small class since. Oh, I don't even know. Probably since the '80s, when I wasn't even teaching at U of I. Since I got since I got hired at the U of I, I've only te taught large lectures. So, so this is new for me, very new. Um, and uh, these surveys, and I mentioned them before. These are uh, you know statistics can be about anything, right? So we might as well have it be about something we're interested in ourselves, right? So. That's what we're going to do. We're going to research ourselves, and who knows better about the data than you do? If you answer these questions, and they're all anonymous, uh, Long Kappa, the main reason I use Long Kappa is because of this anonymous uh, survey tool, that it gives you credit for turning in the survey, but not it doesn't know who turns. I can't know who submitted what. So I uh, might as well be honest. We can discover things that you can't discover any other way. You'll see the value of statistics. You'll learn things that and have real data that we can explore, and you can figure out. Um, we're going to analyze our own data, so it makes it a lot more interesting. So that'll be a lot of fun. So I strongly encourage you to get credit for turning it in. So I only know if you turned it in, not who submitted which answers. And here's how bonus enters into your grade. It's a scaled system, and uh, you can, uh, you know. Uh, the bonus is not worthless. The bonus really is helpful. And so I strongly recommend everybody do it. It helps those with the, uh, at the bottom end who don't do as well in the exams more than it helps. You can look at this formula here. Okay. So now uh, here's what we're the course outline. And so we're going to, whoops, we're going to start with study design. So, and we go all the way through. Um, logistic regression and non-parametric statistics, and we do a serious, a uh, very serious version of these, and a uh, very serious version of multiple regression and de novo, and an extremely serious version of how uh, 
has, uh, including uh, variables in a regression model, multiple regression, uh, can, can help you get at uh, causation, causal inference, can help you what it does. And that's what we're going to try to do. So that's the course. And let's go to the calendar. And when, so here we are. So what's due? So right now, what's due is at the end of this week is one of those pre-lectures I was talking about. And your first homework isn't due. The homework's due on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And the R assignments are due on Sunday, starting uh, Sunday, February 2nd. And uh, and Friday is the bonus work. Bonus is all col colored in blue, and everything required is covered, colored in red. So this is our schedule. And on the 6th and 12th week, on Monday night, we are having our exams from 7 to 8.30. And if you go to the exam schedule, it will tell you more information about that. There's the 12th week. And then, um, so we can... Any questions so far? You're so silent. Um, here's the exam schedule, you can see. Let me think. I must be missing a lot of things, but uh, just no questions so far. Okay. Uh, if you do have questions, always check this frequently asked questions. And if you think of any questions that aren't on here, let me know. Um, what else do I need? So why don't we just take a look at the homework. So you're all online captain now, and let's just look at it. So you have to type in your net ID. And if you're not on, just shoot me an email and I'll add you. Oh shoot, where's my phone? How many of you have already done Lawn Cap in some other course? Raise your hand. Okay. So you select your course. Some of you might only see this course. you want to do is I should do it first of all I should uh, switch to your so look at it from your point of view so let's just put and the first thing you want to do is go to contents Right now you'll see the required homework, the bonus, and the required R exercises. So uh, the bonus is due Tuesday, I mean the required homework one is due Tuesday. Uh, so I, it's open now, so after this lecture you should be able to do this homework. So let me just show you what it looks like. Um, it's multiple choice, and um, for this question, not all of them, but right here it tells you how many uh, tries you have. So I don't want to answer these for you because they have so few tries. Oh, here's a good one. How many subjects completed the protocol? Well, I'll just put in some number. I don't know what the answer is. And then it's going to tell you right away whether you're right or wrong. So you get graded immediately. So it's nice if you don't, there's no late homework, but um, whatever you've done before the due date uh, counts. So it's not like turning in paper homework. We have to turn it in all at once. So just, uh, I suggest that you do the homework right after class or even during class if we have time, we can do some of it. 
So that's the idea. And then um, I think that's pretty much, this is what you're going to see. So the required, I'll open the homework like at least a week before it's due. Any questions? All right, let's just go, I think, let's see if there's anything else that, uh, go to the syllabus one more time. And I think that's it. So let's just jump right into the lecture. So I'm going to go to the document camera now. And here we are. This is the book you need to get, this version, the yellow version, spring 2020 version. And it's available at the item at the bookstore. And you can see the table from the table of contents that there's a lot of topics here. Uh, the first, up until about the first exam, we'll have a lot of stat with overlap. We just about a lot, some new things, but a lot of overlap with stat 100, which is good because you always need a review. And then the rest of the course, most of it will be new. Okay. So let's just start here on page one. Study design. Okay. So um, obviously we do studies to find out if some something um, some treatment has some effect. Like the study we're involved in right now, I'm extremely curious about whether students uh, learn better online or in person or it doesn't make any difference you know people you know have preconceived ideas about this most people think that you have to come to class to learn that might be true for some people and not for others so we'd like to get a handle on who that might be best for and who would do best online so these are the questions that we're interested in and that's why i'm conducting this study i think you we all have things that we problems burning questions that we want to answer. And the only way that we can answer most of these questions is through statistics. So um, now, what's the best way, what we're going to be talking about here, is what the best way to design a study is to answer the questions you want to answer. Okay? So if we want to answer the question, if some treatment really works, how is it best to do it? Well, there's two basic types of studies. One is an experiment, and one is an observational study. And the names of them tell you an experiment is when the researcher sets up the study and decides who is in the, how it's designed, who gets the treatment, and who doesn't. Um, so if the researcher decides how to divide the subjects into treatment, and what's a control group? That is just a comparison group. If you want to see whether a treatment works or not, you have to compare it to something else, right? You give a medicine to somebody who's sick and they get better, well, how do you know they might have gotten better anyway? Maybe the sickness only lasts a couple of days anyway. You need to compare it to somebody who didn't get the medicine. So you always need a comparison group. So that's called a control group. Even if you're comparing two treatments to each other, like an old education method and a new one, like the in-person class to the online, or two groups, you can label one a treatment and one a control. Okay? It doesn't really, usually the innovative one is called the treatment, and the other one is called the control, but really it's just two groups. Okay? I can, you just want a comparison. That's um, an experiment, and an observational study is when, I should write that down, so a control group, because there's so many meanings of the word control. And in this, in statistics, we talk about control a lot. So a control group is just a comparison group. Now, so, um, so if you decide, like, who's in the treatment and who's in the control, you can do that either randomly, you've probably heard about random experiments, randomly, you can do that, or non-randomly. 
And we're going to be talking about these on the next page. We'll get to that. Now, observational studies um, are just like what they say, observational. The researcher has no power over who gets the treatment and who doesn't. They just observe what happens. For example, if you, know, you wanted to study the effects of anything harmful, like smoking or drug use, you're not going to randomly or non-randomly assign people to Treatments can be something that's bad for you, too. It doesn't have to be something that's necessarily good for you. So it's just you want to, as, uh, some intervent, some, something. You just want to see if it's the effect of it. So um, it's subjects themselves or simply fate. Like, for example, you might want to um, study whether firstborn uh, students achieve more academic success than later born students, firstborn in their family. You can't assign things like that or what the implications of you know gender or race, all those things that are just fake. You know, they're not, we can't set, we, we're very interested in um, whether there's discrimination and many, I'm very interested in that and I'd like, you know, we set up really good experiments, try to get at it, but basically we can't assign people to different sexes, races, firstborn, secondborn, etc. So they have to be observational. Many things that we're very interested in are observational. Um, so now, what are we? The idea, the main idea, this ideal study, and we is what is you want the two groups that you're comparing, the treatment and the control group, to be as alike as possible. You want the, ideally you'd like identical twins. Or clones would be even better, right? Just clones. Um, so if everybody, you know, if we all had a clone right now, who was, you were in the in-person class and your clone was in the online class. And we compared the difference between you. You know, who learned, who did better on the, uh, at the end of the course. That would be the ideal experiment. So we're trying to get at that as much as possible. That's what we're trying for. So we want the only difference between the actual treatment and, I mean, the, between the treatment and the control group to be the actual treatment and nothing else. So then when you measure the risk, so let's just look at these scales I have here. So I want before the treatment, whatever it is, let's say it was a drug, you want to start off with the two groups. Let's say this is the treatment group. And this is the control group. You want them to be completely balanced. Right? You see, you want them to start off balanced. Before you even give the drug, this is how you want them to look. So that's why identical twins would be the best, or clones. Then, <clears throat> after you give them the drug, you're going to measure their response. So now, so you're going to measure it on some, let's say, with some quantitative response here. So we're going to compare the responses of the two groups on some quantitative measurement. All right, so do this. And you can see now, on this measurement, they're different. So we can, if they were the same at the start, and the only thing that was different was they got the drug, well then we can say that the difference in these responses must be due to the drug because everything else is the same. Do you understand? <coughs> so if we had clones and everything, that would be the best way. This is our ideal. This is what we're aiming for. So, um, and obviously with observational studies, when people choose themselves, choose to smoke or choose to do some kind of drug, they might be doing other unhealthy life, uh, making other unhealthy uh, choices. So it's very hard to separate out what the effect of what we're trying to study is from those other, what we call them, um, other, other causes. It's, it's very difficult. Okay, so now, um, 
because there's these differences between when there's, so we just want to make them the same. So the differences mix up our results. If they start off unbalanced to begin with, think about it. They ended up like this. But if they start off unbalanced, and we can't even measure this balance, because there's so many, we're not sure even how to measure. What if they started off like even more unbalanced like this? Then this could have the, this brought the treatment group down. Or they said, you just don't know what happened. It's very confusing in observational studies. And we're going to spend a lot of our course time teasing out how we can get at um, this situation. Think of all the th differences we can think of and try to uh, separate them out from the one that we're interested in. So that's what a lot of this course is about. So now how does this random and non-random figure in? If we are able, as an experimenter, to choose, you've probably heard randomly is the best. But why would it be the best? Wouldn't it be better, certain if you had clones, or identical twins, would you still randomize? Let's think about this and other issues. So we're going to think about, um, on the next page here, we're going to uh, do a hypothetical study and think about different ways that we could, as researchers, set up the experiment and the pros and cons of each. So, on page two here, this is a hypothetical study made up. So let's say a drug designed to help students learn stats was proven to be safe. And the university decided to conduct a study to test the effectiveness <coughs> in this class. So we are going to set up an experiment. So what's the best way to make the treatment and control groups as alike as possible? <coughs> so probably the easiest thing to do would be what? If we really thought that worked, we'd just give everyone the drug. Everybody would want it if it you know, looked like it was really promising and safe. And then we'd just say, hey, um, how does it compare to last semester? And there's, I mean, we've learned something. With people, all of a sudden, people, you know, certainly a dramatic effect, you see. But certainly, so the control group would be last semester or previous semesters. And the treatment group would be the people getting the drug. So they're clearly different. We'd still learn something, but um, the past, they're not going to be the same. Because why? Past, even if I gave the same exams, are always different than present ones. I certainly might teach differently. Um, you know, I certainly do from uh, semester to semester. We're human, we, we change. You're different. So, uh, you know, conditions are uh, different. Political events are different. People are going to be worrying maybe about the election, and they weren't, you know, different things happen. So it's always, uh, and certainly if it was some kind of medical, uh, you know, vaccines and stuff, you know, they depend completely on a huge amount of whether the, what flus are around. So past can different, dish, yeah. So treatment and control will of course be different. I don't think I have to explain this anymore. Now this is what I love doing. This is what's happening right now because I'm all for freedom of choice. And I want to give the students as much freedom as possible. So I love the idea of letting students themselves decide what they want. And to a certain extent, you have to do that. If it's a drug, you can't force people to be in an experiment. So everybody who participates in the experiment are people who consented to it. And then you could assign them to treatment and control. But if you just let the students themselves decide, that seems like by far the simplest way. And that's exactly what's happening now. I'm letting everybody decide whether they want to be in the online or the in-person. And that's a great way to operate if you already, it's a great way to operate if you're not doing an experiment. But if you're doing an experiment, it's not a very good way to find out which works better. Okay? So why? Because the people who choose to be in person, 
might be more conscientious people that want to come to class, or the people who choose to be online might be more confident about online, uh, about technical skills, which might uh, be relevant to statistics. So there's going to be differences between the two groups that are going to be hard to sort out, and that's the situation we're in now. And we're going to be looking at last semester's data and the semester before, and uh, doing some exercises trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, it introduces selection bias because people are selecting themselves. When I say bias, that's systematic differences. There might be systematic differences between the two people. So students who choose um, the treatment or their treatment are likely to be systematically different and those differences sorry there those differences could easily be relevant, could affect the outcome, affect the responses. Right? Okay. Now, give the drug to those students most likely to benefit from it and give the rest to placebo. Well, this is kind of backwards because the whole reason we are doing this experiment is to find out who will benefit. So we really don't know until after maybe we've done some experiments so, and then want to refine them or something. So, um, again, we're deliberate here, you know, so there's again selection bias. We're choosing some, you know, we're deliberately choosing. We don't know who's going to benefit and we're deliberately um, making the two groups different. And remember, our goal is to make them the same. So we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot here. Even though the intentions are very good, we really want to do this. You know, those students who really seem like just need that boost, you know, if you're not doing an experiment, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the best way to operate both of these. You want to help those students. Of course, I would want to, and most people would. So of course we do these, but that's not a good way to conduct a study to find out what works and what doesn't. That's the idea. Now, how about this one? That we, our goal is to make the two groups as alike as possible. So matching the two groups on all relevant characteristics, like for uh, how well they would do in stats, maybe their prior ACT scores, prior math background, etc. Um, and then you try to balance the two groups. This is sort of like trying as much as possible to make them identical twins. You could do this by trying to match pairs, trying to match them on all the characteristics, or try to pick out people who are as much as possible on everything you can think of twins, like have the same ACT scores, the same math background, et cetera, and then um, put one in one group and one in the other. Um, this is great as a first step. In fact, that would be an ideal way to do it, to try to find match people up. But then, why is it a problem just to leave it that way? Let me um, try something. Uh, so I'm going to put something on the screen for just uh, a set of numbers on the screen for just um, three seconds or less. And I want you to choose one of these numbers. It's just an experiment. So here are the numbers. Just choose one. Did everybody see those numbers, by the way? So how many people chose one? Raise your hand. One person chose one. What's your name? Paul chose one. And no one else chose one. OK, how many people chose three? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Many, many more people chose three. How many people chose four? 
one person chose four, one person chose one, and many people chose three. How about two? Three people chose two. So three was the overwhelming favorite. You, I said just randomly choose a number. So what this illustrates, what that experiment illustrates, is that we have systematic preferences. Humans are hardwired to have them. Many that we are completely unaware of. So unless we introduce a random assignment, if we match them all up, try to find match pairs, try to find them as close as possible, the final step has to be random because we don't want to introduce systematic preferences. That is the key. We don't want to introduce them. Even if they're identical twins, they're not exactly alike. We might over and over and over again, it's been shown that people unconsciously have these preferences that distort things. So, what you want to do is get rid of all those systematic differences. And then, random differences will still be there, but they won't be going in one direction or the other. And with a big enough sample size, they average out. So that's the main reason. It's great as a first step. It's really good. It's just hard to do sometimes. It takes a lot of work. It's great as a first step. And all experiments where, I mean, if you have a, okay, well, first let's write this down. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I get very excited about experimental design, so. <laughs> it's great as a first step, but um, the final assignment to treatment and control must be random. Otherwise, systematic differences, bias, will be introduced. And bias on, you know, there's relevant characteristics, but there are going to be a lot of relevant characteristics that we haven't identified. And um, these, you know, for those, we absolutely don't want bias to creep in, you know. There could be things we haven't even thought about that could affect whether somebody uh, does better, you know, with the drug or not with the drug. Always with the treatment of the control, there's going to be things we haven't identified. And we want those to be, uh, you know, evenly distributed as much as possible between the two groups. Okay? So this, by far, is the best way. Ra oh, wait a minute. Do this first and then that. Randomly assign. Okay, so what, is this better than that? Well, it depends. You always want a random element, ideally. Okay, this is the best way. Again, the final assignment has to be random. And <clears throat> randomization eliminates the key, one key point that I didn't write down is that randomization um, eliminates bias on um, you know all characteristics, not just the ones not just the ones we were able to identify as relevant. And here's, so that's one key point. Um, another key point is, I think you all know this, that randomization 
uh, averages out <coughs> differences. It leads to accidental differences, right? If you flip a coin ten times, you're not going to get exact a fair coin. You're not going to get exactly five heads and five tails. But if you flipped it hundreds of times, you're going to get very close to 50% heads and 50% tails. Or if you flip it just six times, you could easily end up with very uneven percentages. So um, in the long run, though, it averages out. So, random, so if you have a big study, random differences. So random differences average out with enough subjects. Do systematic differences average out? Do they? No. If I was in a class with, you know, let's just, uh, if there was a, I've done that one, two, three, four experiment in a class with 600 people, and you still see, it doesn't, it doesn't change. You still see those same percentages of overwhelmingly pro three an overwhelmingly uh, very small number of ones. So they don't average out. That's the differences. Random differences average out with enough subjects, but um, systematic differences don't. But bias does not. All right. So if you have what people do, let's just go get to the real world here. So what do people do if you read, I hope you do read uh, statistical studies and statistical papers, and ones in medicine, for example, um, are good for illustrating this because there's a huge amount of ran, um, RCTs, randomized controlled uh, trials in medicine. So um, even if the study is huge, they block on what they think is really important, things that they think are really relevant, even if the study is huge. And uh, you'll always see some blocking because they want to reduce that variation as much as possible between the two groups. But they, the last step is always random. And um, often uh, with really large studies, you know, theoretically, if you had a huge study, you wouldn't block. But generally speaking, why not? If something's really important and you want even numbers of like males and females, you block first and then randomize. So let's look at how blocking is done. I said I was going to teach you through examples. And so whatever I say will stick a huge amount better by doing the blocking example. So I'll show you what I mean. So let's do that. And let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. okay. I want to finish this chapter. So we'll do that. All right. So um, let's see. I think this is just Repetition here, let's see. Make sure I didn't forget anything here. Um, okay, so random assignment, this is just works best because it eliminates systematic differences with enough subjects, differences random out. Average out, sorry. Blocking. Okay. So with small samples, and even with large ones, but particularly with small ones, subjects uh, you block first. Think about it. If you only have 10 subjects and half of them are males and half of them are females, you want um, each, uh, or 20 subjects and half are males and females, you'd want um, them to be evenly distributed. It could very easily get uneven, so you block first. So how do you do that? Let me show you. So here's an example. Um, suppose there are only 36 students in the class, and 18 of them have A averages in previous math courses, and 18 of them have B averages. And so we're, and we're doing this study on whether this drug is going to help them learn. With 36 students, you could easily result in large act. This is no blocking. Look at this. So let's say we took the 30, this is everyone. You have 18 A's and 18 B's, and you randomly divide them. It wouldn't be that unusual to get 13 A's and 5 B's, and 5 A's and 13 B's. That's very unbalanced. And so the treat would 
be heavily favoring the treatment. So we don't want that to happen. Now, that would be very unlikely if we had 180 A's and 180 B's to get that kind of difference. So now, when you block, what do you do? <coughs> what you do is you put all the A students together, the 18 here, and all the B's. And then, after you block on this relevant characteristic here, what do you do? You randomly assign them. So here, it's randomly assigned after the blocking right here. And so you randomly take nine of these students out and put them here. Just reach in and randomly take nine out, not looking, and then put the other nine A students here. And the same with the Bs. And then you will end up where there'll be the same proportion on that characteristic. It's really important. Rather than having this, and you haven't introduced any bias. You haven't introduced any bias at all. You've just ensured less variation. And people always say, well, you chose to introduce bias. But no, you didn't. You just made sure that your groups were more alike because then when you randomly divide them here, this is where it could come in bias if you didn't randomly divide them at all they would come in. But when you randomly divide them, we don't have systematic differences, but we have terrible groups. We don't have balanced groups. This will happen here. Accidental differences in small samples can be ba are bad. Right? So it reduces accidental variation, random variation. That's all. Any questions on that? I see some people falling asleep. Do you understand? I mean, that's a, because people think, oh, Random has to be random from the start. As soon as humans decide to do anything, somehow it messes up the randomization. I see this all the time. But this doesn't mess it up at all. It just ensures that our groups are more alike on the characteristics that we've identified. You know what? I think if we had clones, like if you split, like let's say we all split right at this second into two people, and we're exactly alike. Then, I don't think I would have to randomize at the last. That would probably be the only time I wouldn't have to randomize, because you know that they're exactly the same. So it's not that randomization has to be there, but in real life it does. So even if you're identical twins, or even if you were clones, like a, a year ago, or a month ago, or a day ago, events happened and changed you. So in real, in any regular situation, Randomize at the last moment, and it would never hurt. You know, even if you split right that second, it would never hurt. Okay, you got it? All right. So now let's write this. Why would this be? Now we're just going to have to summarize what we just said. All right, blah, 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 blah. Um, with only 36 students, why is this a problem, is what I'm asking. Why? Because. Um, Why is it a problem? Because the treatment and control are different. Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> because we wouldn't be able to tell that they're different. So we're talking about this situation where there's 13 A's in treatment. We wouldn't be, at the end of the study, we wouldn't be able to tell if the drug worked what? If the response was due to the drug, if that's why the treatment group did better, or to um, the group, the treatment group, having more A students. How would you know? Let's say they'd do better at the end, but you wouldn't know whether it was the drug or the fact that they had more A students, right? So what's the next question say? Can you think of a way to ensure the same proportion of, like, let's say, stat and non-stat majors in each group, but still randomize? Yes, block. That's what we just said. If you think if you want stat and non-stat majors, that could make a big difference. Block. Um, could that introduce bias? How? Um, no. 
Could it introduce bias? No. As long as you block first and then randomize, right? So you block on everything you can and then randomize. Don't say, hey, I've got uneven groups here. I'm just going to switch them around. Oh, I'll put this person over here and looking around. And don't ever do that. That will definitely introduce bias. Um, is it always better to block first and then randomize with a large sample? Yes, it is. But it becomes less and less necessary the bigger your sample is. So with, with really big studies, lots of times people don't block. Any questions? Can I just ask a, a, a sign? Uh, are, is anybody getting frustrated with the handwriting? Because I can try to write better. Raise your hand. I'm going to try to write better. But if it's really illegible, let me know. OK, good. All right. Now, um, let's, what's the last thing you need to do? We are on the last page here, and then we're going to leave. And what time is it? Okay, we have, what, 20 minutes left? Is that right? So let's just, I think this won't take us long at all. Well, last part. So what, what is, this is sort of a summary. Um, as long as there's enough subjects, flipping a coin to decide who's in treatment and who's in control is ideal for two basic reasons. We just said it eliminates, it's, Random assignment is going to make, eliminate bias, human bias. That will. There could still be these accidental differences, but they average out in the long run. Okay. Um, so that's important. The whole thing's important. <coughs> What's this? This is random controls are based on chance procedure. Without a chance procedure, we can't use statistics to analyze whether the treatment really worked. All right, so what I'm saying is that, um, let's just, let's go back to our example. Let's say we're at the end of the experiment and the treatment group, we randomized and the treatment group, let's say it's big enough, we just did, let's just do the simple random selection, simple random sample. So we randomize into the treatment group and the control group. At the end of the experiment, we find overall that the treatment group, let's say, got two points higher overall average. You know, that difference is important. Maybe it's the difference between, certainly in your grade, whether you get an A or a, uh, a minus or a B plus maybe even. Um, and, but, can you say for sure that it, the difference was due to the treatment, right, or not? So the best way to think about this is if we used randomization, you could say, okay, um, let's say, just imagine, you think about how big a difference you get just by the fact that you're different people in the two groups. You're randomly assigned to the two different groups. You're not exactly the same, right? So, uh, so imagine you, you look at what difference you would get just by random division. So let's say I just uh, took all your scores at the end, let's say there were 200 people, all your scores, and put, and randomly divided them into two equal parts, randomly, and compared averages. How likely would it be to get a two-point difference between the average, right? I mean, certainly it's possible we could get a much bigger difference between the average. You're not going to get exactly the same averages, right? There's going to be some difference. So at what point can you say, hey, this difference um, is so big, so unlikely that it's due, must be due to the treatment, not just to a random division. 
And that's the idea of significance tests. It's the idea of p-values, p-values, say, uh, measure the likelihood of getting such a difference or more extreme just by randomization. And if it's uh, very small, then you would say, hey, I think the drug works. I think it wasn't, you know, you would reject that it was just due to chance variation, and you think that there's this particular cause for it, and since the only thing that's different is the drug, you assume it's the drug. So that's the idea, and we're going to be talking about that a lot more, and that's what we're going to be doing. So that's this idea, that if you have a chance procedure, um, then you can, um, answer that question of how big a difference, how likely the difference you see is just due to chance variation. Okay? And so we'll do, without random controls, you have no way You know, if you just try to set them up and make them equal, we have no way of answering that. So this is what significance tests, confidence intervals, p-values are all about. You know, we're going to decide whether something worked or not. All right, now, the last thing I want to talk about, and this is we're going to look at in part extensively throughout the semester, and it's going to start in part six. It's the significance test. But statistics is all about, the entire study of statistics is about random variation. That's what it is. And it's all built on probability. All the statistical methods are built on probability models. So what's so unusual about um, step 100 and 200 is that um, we make those probability models explicit. We make them explicit and it's very useful these days, particularly in doing uh, computer simulations, because which we're going to do some, um, because teasing out what the important chance uh, random process is in any situation that you're interested in is key. So you'll be very uh, adept at doing that at the end of this course. And um, it just makes it a much more logically tight course. So before you do some statistical method, you say, hey, does this even make sense? You know, is, it, what, is the problem that we're trying to solve, can you think of analogous, analogous uh, random procedure that we can model? And that's what is key to every statistical procedure. And it's usually implicit, and people usually skip it and just say, oh, I see this situation, and I'm going to just associate it with, oh, I'll do this type of thing, this type of analysis. You know, see this, do that, without really thinking if that's even the question you want to answer. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really a travesty that we do it, teach it that way. And so I think people are now really, especially with uh, computers being much more a part of it, I think people are realizing how important it is to uh, think about uh, the underlying probability models. All right, so now, the last thing, remember our goal, we're still on how to design a best experiment, and we want to eliminate two other things, psychological biases, the subject bias. So even if we ideally, if you're testing some, the control group should in every way be like the treatment group. So if the treatment group is getting some intervention, like a drug, the control group should, think, should, should also get that, because you want to eliminate the psychological effect of thinking you're in the treatment group, which is very well documented. Uh, I remember my pharmacist telling me before Viagra, Viagra, he said he would just do his own little placebos. He said it was very successful and sell guys um, these pills. And he said that the bigger they were and the fancier they were and also more expensive, the better they worked and they were so pleased. And he, you know, so it was all, it was kind of a fun discussion, but I, you know, he was very, he, there were some people who really relied on them. I mean, placebos make a difference, particularly in, uh, you know, a lot of things you all, you all know like math anxiety, sexual anxiety, all these things do, having to do with psychological effects are going to be hugely important. So, uh, we want to separate the idea of the treatment from the treatment itself. So this is important. I think you are, most people are familiar with that and also evaluator bias. You know, if the doctor knows who's in which group or the uh, person who's conducting the study, they might treat them differently. 
especially if they have some vested interest in the treatment working, which most people do, why else are they trying to do this, they might see um, effects that aren't there. So both of these, uh, the best way to conduct that is by having, uh, how would you do that? Like in this study that we just talked about, um, I wouldn't, you wouldn't know which group you're in once you consented to be in the group. To be in the experiment, you wouldn't know. You'd never know which whether you, you know. And <clears throat> unless the pill had some terrible side effects, the real drug or something, you might know. And um, I wouldn't know. And then the blind is broken at the end of the study, and that's when you figure it all out. So you don't know who's in the treatment and who's in the control. In fact, even in analyzing the results of this experiment, I don't do it till the end, until everybody's like, I don't, I don't look at who's, look how it's going throughout the study, and do the analysis, and then you're pretty much blind. Okay, so now, um, so that's the ideal method, the randomized controlled, um, blind study and um, and it also it allows us to get at co conclude causation because if everything is the same except for the treatment then we can conclude causation so um, so that's the idea any questions on any of this so um, that's the end of this lecture, and next time you're ready now to do your first homework, and to also do the pre-lectures, try those, and then next time we'll start with observational studies. You're welcome to read ahead if you want. See you next time. And look for this video on our calendar if you want to, in a couple of hours if you're in the in-person So, if you have any questions, you can come up, I'll stay till the end of the hour and ask.